Good evening, everyone. Uh, slight change of title, this one. It's, I've just described it surviving without generics. Um, I, this is very much a Go experience report of writing a uh, library, uh, handling, handling geospatial uh, types. I'll talk a bit about that. It's an area where having generics would have been very helpful, and um, uh, I would have written it quite differently had I had them. So I'm going to talk about a few of the problems I encountered and the ways I worked around the lack of generics in, in Go. Um, the library itself uh, is GoGeom. It's for handling geospatial data. Uh, this is the sort of thing you'll use if you're going to write the back end for Google Maps, Google Earth, or you want to develop something like Strava, where you're going to analyze GPS track logs over time, that sort of thing. Um, this is something I do a lot for fun. Um, I wanted to create a nice, usable library with a clean API. Um, I was less worried about the implementation, but I wanted it to be easy to use. It needs to handle different types of geometries. I'll talk about those. It converts things in various common formats like KML and GPX and IGC and WKB and so on. And it provides a number of operations on these uh, geometries. And underneath the hoods, sometimes I'm handling quite a lot of data. Um, for example, I use this in a project um, where uh, for a big race called the Red Bull X Alps, where we had people racing across the Alps for 12 days with data coming in at one second um, uh, from uh, 30 different teams. And I wanted to do um, a fair amount of analysis and um, presentation of that data. What's it doing? It's using open geo style, local open geo consortium style geometries. This is the open source geospatial world. They have effectively three different types of geometry, points, line strings, and polygons, which can exist in either as single individual items or as multi things. Example, a point might be the location of your French door. A multi point might be all the water fountains in Zurich. A line string might be a road, a multi-line string that could be separate things, or it could be something like um, they describe how a river would be with all its tributaries as a single object as a multi-line string. Polygon, footprint of a building, uh, a multi-polygon, think of a country uh, with many, uh, many islands, a multi-polygon with holes. I mean, if you've seen a map of Switzerland, you know that there's little bits of Germany inside Switzerland, there's little bits of Switzerland, I'm not sure if there's bits of Switzerland inside Germany, but it's definitely not, it's a little bit complicated. So overall, we've got many different, uh, these different types. There's um, seven basic types there. Uh, linear ring is just a component of a polygon. It's either the outer ring or one of the holes inside. Um, they also define something called a geometry collection, which I'm not going to talk much about because it's just weird and doesn't behave like anything else. And it is definitely way beyond uh, not having generics. The sort of things the library includes is for Operations on these, computing bounding boxes, convex hells, et cetera, et cetera. Um, for geospatial stuff, there's a few different dimensions here to this problem. So people might have this, I want it to be a generic, useful library, so people are going to have different types of data. Um, 2D, 3D, 2D with a measure. A measure is typically time. Uh, think of you know, a running track, for example, a running track log where you've got someone's position evolving over time. Maybe 3D with time, which would be so next time you jump on a plane and you fly, you take your GPS and record your flight to Berlin or something, you're evolving in 3D over time. Uh, you might want to add, and it's very convenient to be able to add extra per, per coordinate numerical data. In the case of running track log, it might be your, your heart rate, for example. Um, on top of that, for efficiency reasons, people might want to use different types as that particular coordinate. Um, float 64 obviously covers most things, but maybe you want to use float 32s for, um, for um, efficiency or, or safe space requirements, or you might want to use ints if you're using this in, say, a game world where you've got much more control over the coordinate system. So this is our first sort of dimension of the problem, is the different type, we need to cover different coordinate types. And if we had generics, we'd, this would definitely be a template parameter. Combining two, we've got sort of six, seven different geometry types. We've got different dimensionalities, um, like is it 2D, 3D, 4D, or different types of, um, of actual ordinates. It gives us multiple combinations. And this is really where it would be nice if we didn't have to write 72 bits of code or code to avoid this. Of course, my first attack was code generation. Um, this is what it looked like at the point I abandoned it. Um, this is just doing points with uh, either 2D, uh, 2D with a measure, 3D, and 3D with a measure. Um, this is Go's text template uh, library. 
Um, the formatting is a little bit weird because I wanted the output to be valid go functed code. Uh, that's why you're seeing multiple things on, um, on a line here. Um, this quickly gets, becomes very, very painful. Um, particular problem, it's not particularly flexible. This is only adding one dimension to those three dimensions of, of the problem I have. This is only coping with um, limited types. You know, it's still fixed on float 64s. Um, that's not a parameter. Of course, you can extend it, but it just gets worse. It's hard to read, it's hard to write, it's hard to modify. Um, for this case, this is the implementation for points. If I'm doing it for line strings and polygons, I duplicate this code six times. Um, and whenever you come up with a better way of doing it, you've got to modify it in six different places. It just doesn't scale, so not fun. Um, so how do we get version two? This is like, the, the crux of the talk, really. So trying to do this without using code generation. And actually, there was zero code generation until about a few weeks ago where I found a very cool library. Um, the three different approaches I took to work around lack of generics. Simplifying the problem, uh, moving type information, compile time to runtime, read this, and then exploiting common structure in the, uh, in the nature of the, pro of the <coughs> library I'm solving. And I do use a little bit of limited generation I'll talk about. So firstly, simplify the problem. I mean, this is kind of a bit silly to just say, I'm just gonna support float 64s. Um, but if you can cut off one dimension, it really helps. And when you're developing software, a lot of the, the problem comes from having complex software. If you, uh, if you can make your problem simpler, you can massively reduce the development time, just mass make it massively easier. So uh, executive decision, I'm just gonna do float 64s, it'll be okay. Um, the second aspect is moving type information from compile time to runtime. So particularly for the particular ordinates where you have multiple number of dimensions, Instead of having this a parameter that's checked at compile time, I now represent coordinates as a variable length slice. Um, this is not exactly the code that's in the library for reasons we'll go into later, but it gives you a rough idea of what's going on. A point now, it has num a coordinate which is only length is only known at runtime. A layout which tells you um, which elements of the array correspond to which dimension. Uh, I'll talk about stride in a moment, the implementation of layout. Um, we then have to do runtime checks to let's interrogate with at a point, does this have a Z index? Um, you can see the simple switch here. Based on given a layout, it will tell me where to find the Z coordinate if this particular coordinate has, has one. Um, the stride is so that we can pack in those extra um, numerical dimensions like the heart rates, one example that I talked about. Now you can pack it into that same array and by having a stride that's longer the number of dimensions you need just for your layout, you get your extra data in there. What this does, what it means, it changes the, the way the code looks. The Now instead of getting the compiler to catch th when things are mismatched, uh, we have to actually check for errors ourselves uh, at runtime. Um, the top level code is still reasonably nice, um, but you see these are all now runtime parameters. These the sort of errors that you, you'd get here is if I don't su supply in a sufficiently large enough array, if I want an X, Y, Z, and I've only given it two elements, or if I give it an array of four elements, then there's gonna be a runtime error, um, which of course you need to handle. Um, but this, on its, this, this approach was helpful. The final one, and perhaps the most interesting one, is exploiting common structure in the problem. If you think back to the different types that um, we have, I'll just go back to the slide. Um, well, you can observe a point is just a single coordinate. Line strings and multipoints both have an array of coordinates or multiple coordinates. If you take a polygon and a multi line string, or rather better, a polygon with holes and a, and a multi line string in this particular picture, the polygon with holes has got one ring defining the outside, which is a set of coordinates, and actually an ordered set of coordinates, and a hole, which is another ordered set. And this is the same as the multi-line string, which also has two sets of coordinates, and so on and so on. So taking half a step back and thinking what we've actually got here, we see that there is commonality in the, um, in the different structures themselves, how, they, what they're, how the data is represented underneath. Uh, you can see there, point, single coordinate, 
line, line strings, um, linear rings, et cetera, an array of coordinates, and so on with different nesting depth. So the approach then is to reduce this from having to write the code seven times to having to write the code four times, kind of, is to then implement this um, common code in private structs, which are internal to um, the package. Um, and then we, the exported types, embed uh, these private structs, which have methods implemented on them. Um, and with a little bit of wrapping, we actually get a reasonably usable uh, API. What does this actually look like? Um, this is, I'll go, I'll go through it step by step. So the top level coordinate contains a single n dimensional point. This has the layout and the stride uh, from before. Uh, flat chords, I'll explain in a moment, but for a single coordinate, it's just the values of that particular coordinate. Um, then we're our actual, um, we are our actual exported type just anonymously embeds that particular structure. John 1, uh, which is this one level depth we use for line strings and multipoints, actually doesn't need much more than uh, what's in John 0. But now instead of having just one coordinate embedded in our flat coordinates array, we have them sequentially, one after the other, in the flat coordinates array, every stride elements. We can work out how many elements we've got because uh, we know the overall length of the slice. We divide that by the stride. That gives us our number of points in our, our multi-point or our line string. Um, for the next level up, um, multi-line strings here, we use the same. We embed all the coordinates into the single flat array. That has some advantages. But now we need to know which set of coordinates or range of coordinates within that array correspond to which particular line string. Um, and so we maintain an extra ends slice, which tells us the end of each, um, uh, the, the index of the end of each, each line or each component. This embedding into flat chord stuff has a couple of nice effects. It means that we can um, write some code that operates on John zeros. Um, I'll give an example of that in a moment. Um, and then we get this code also used for the other geometry types. Uh, it has nice performance effects. Um, by embedding it into a single linear array, C is very cache friendly. CPUs are really good at just churning through data when it's already in the cache lines, ready to load. If you use nested arrays, um, even though it's often easier to write the code, these, the actual memory used ends up scattered over, over your memory. You might get page faults, Stuff's not necessarily in cache. And in some benchmarking, I found that by lining up every stuff, everything up linearly um, in memory, I got about a 30% speed boost uh, from that, which is quite significant when you're dealing with larger geometries. And it was nice because even though Go is not the fastest language around, it gave it good performance, good usable performance. What does this finally look like? Uh, um, so three different examples here. Firstly, computing the bounds. I haven't um, given the code notation um, because basically if you're count computing the bounding box of any uh, particular geometric object, it, the actual structure of the object doesn't matter at all. You just care what the points are. So you can just iterate over all your coordinates, uh, compute the minimum and maximum in each dimension, and you get the bounds. So this single implementation of bounds now works for all seven geometry types and all um, and no matter how many dimensions there are uh, in the coordinate type, in the ordinate type. This doesn't quite work all the ways, particularly when it comes to return values. So um, this example of set chords and a line string, which replaces the coordinate set in an existing line string. We need to return a line string type from this. This is useful for, uh, well, you just, if you want to keep track of the types, it's useful for method chaining. Um, but if we write this method on GL1, which is our sort of underlying data structure for things which have arrays of coordinates, um, we cannot return a GL1 and just then use it as a line string elsewhere. So we have to write an extra wrapper function which calls the embedded set chords, which is the, the common code, and um, does the, type, the, the return stuff of the correct type. Um, that works, I assume.
um, and massively reduces the, the amount of code I had to write. So now I've got, actually, it turns out, four core geom types uh, supporting seven different publicly exported types. The final one, um, which I'll talk very quickly about, because uh, very briefly about, it's not my project, but it's very cool. Um, this is the only bit of code generation that I'm now using. Uh, it's a project called uh, GoDerive. And um, I have it open, hopefully it's this person. Next generation code, uh, code gen for Go. The, what this does is effectively it um, analyzes your Go code um, ahead of time, uh, sorry, offline, generates common methods which are either annoying or difficult to get right for you. The way you use it is actually very, uh, it's very straightforward. This is my deep copy um, uh, method, which I want every, every uh, type to support. All I write is I return derive clone line string. What matters here is go derive, we'll pick out this derive clone section and go, hey, okay, I need to build a, um, a clone method for this. It does, it works out the types and it then it generates the actual um, uh, cl safe clone method from this. Um, this is actually goes a little bit recursive. There's the code for deep copy two, which is all more to generated code. This, it does full structural analysis, so, but this just works. Um, I found it to be much less painful to use than writing these, repeating these methods myself. Uh, now it's one line rather than multiple lines. And of course, it's much more, uh, much less error prone. For example, here, the generated code includes proper nil checking. Um, it, yeah, it just works better. Um, so I'm using Go Derive to co then cover the, these basic examples. And that's it, basically. So surviving that generics, the three approaches I think, simplifying my requirements to um, just eliminate one of the uh, combinations of, uh, that causes complexity. Moving compile time uh, checks to runtime. Yes, this is a little bit painful, but you know, it works. Exploiting the structure of the problem to reduce the code that I had to write, uh, and a little just a bit of code generation uh, here and there. That's it. Thank you. Thank you.